Hi, this is Sally Eckes from the Eckes Group, and you're listening to the Eat Blog Talk podcast. Hey, awesome food bloggers. Before we dig into this episode, I have a really quick favor to ask you. Go to your favorite podcast player, go to Eat Blog Talk, scroll down to the bottom where you see the ratings and review section. Leave Eat Blog Talk a five-star rating if you love this podcast and leave a great review. This will only benefit this podcast. It adds value. And I so very much appreciate your efforts with this. Thank you so much for doing this. Okay, now on to the episode. Hey, food bloggers. Welcome to Eat Blog Talk, the podcast for food bloggers looking for the value and confidence that will move the needle forward in their businesses. This episode is sponsored by Rank IQ. I'm your host, Megan Porta, and you are listening to episode number 329. Today, I have Sally Eckes with me. I'm super excited to have a follow-up conversation. She's going to go over Cookbook Publishing 201 as kind of a follow-up to her initial episode, which was Cookbook Publishing 101. So this will be a little bit more advanced. Sally Eckes is the lead agent and co-owner at the Eckes Group, a full-service culinary agency specializing in literary and talent representation. She represents a wide range of culinary, health, wellness, and lifestyle talent, from first-time cookbook authors to seasoned chefs, RDs, professional food writers and bloggers, and internet and YouTube personalities. From concept to contract, she has brokered over 300 book deals with top publishers, including Penguin, Random House, HarperCollins, Hachette, Simon & Schuster, and numerous indie publishers. To honor the Eckes Group's 40th anniversary this spring, she launched a self-paced online course called How to Write a Cookbook. Its bite-sized curriculum distills four decades of cookbook publishing knowledge into less than three hours. Leveraging Sally's expertise, aspiring authors are already fast-tracking their success by overcoming the steep learning curve of today's evolving industry climate. Sally, it's such a pleasure to have you back on the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm good, Megan. Thank you so much for having me back. I love talking about this stuff. (laughs) Yes, I know you do. I can always hear and feel your passion. So I'm excited to get into this. I've personally been hearing a lot of talk about cookbook publishing in our space. So I think this will be really relevant. But first, before we start digging into that, do you have a second fun fact to share with us? Yeah. So I was thinking in my other life before I did this type of publishing hospitality, I sort of was on the the server side of the hospitality industry. And I I worked for two summers on Nantucket for a very swanky family where I got to be a part of fun catering events. And for one of them, it provided me the opportunity to meet Jim Carrey and I got to clean up his trash and it was awesome (laughs) and so nice and so funny. And not only did I get to like clean up his trash at the beach party, but I also got to talk with him. Oh my gosh. Okay. Tell me a detail. Like, what do you remember most about him? I remember his smile and kindness because we were in Nantucket. You can drive on certain beaches with permits. So you put the pressure down in your car tires. And I was driving one car and there was a car in front of me and we're trying to figure out which way to go on the beach. And I, I'll just, I distinctly remember like the car in front of me paused to see which way we should go. Somebody got out of the driver's seat, turned around, looked at me and sort of did that gesture of like, our uh, shoulders up which way to go. And it was him. And he was just (gasps) smiling and looking so happy. And I was like, I have no idea which way to go. Jim Carrey's asking me for directions. (laughs) (laughs) That is the coolest thing ever. I love when people meet celebrities and they're actually really kind. He was so nice. Oh, I love that. He seems like super quirky, but just someone that you would want to hang out with. Like totally fun and creative. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Super cool. I love that. And you came up with that on the fly. So great job. Thank you. you. (laughs) Yes. Okay. Let's dig into cookbooks. You are so passionate about this and you have a longstanding history with this topic. I guess we can start out just by doing a refresher on having you talk about what an agent is and where food bloggers could find one if they're interested in publishing a cookbook. Sure. Well, so an agent is a representative on behalf of the author. So my clients are authors. An agent represents the author and the and your book concept to a publisher. We also advise on the readiness of a book proposal for sale. So I work with clients on the development of their idea and the comprehensiveness of their proposal. And then one of the things I love about being an agent is the matchmaking side of it. So as an agent, we're matching the book with the best editor for the project. And then ultimately the agent is selling the book and negotiating the contract with the publisher. 
And as part of this process, agents, they analyze industry trends and have these established relationships with editors and different publishing houses. So ultimately, an agent is an author representative and where to find them. I mean, I'm pretty active on social media. Some agents are not all literary agents specialize in culinary representation either. So you want to take a look at bios, websites, what people are looking for and how they like to be queried. And ultimately, you could also take a look in the acknowledgement section of some of your colleagues' cookbooks, because oftentimes an agent will be thanked. You can also find agents on industry sites like Publishers Marketplace, which I just learned from a different podcast, the Everything Cookbooks podcast, that you can actually subscribe for just one day to look at the different book deals. So I didn't realize that. And it's a great tool to do some research. And you can also find agents at conferences and different industry events. Yeah. Or you can just call Sally. Yeah, please don't. No, just kidding. Uh, you can just call me. Absolutely. But before you do, please take a look at the types of books I represent, what I'm looking for, and how I like to be queried. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome advice. And I loved that uh, little piece you said about looking in the backs of books or like yeah. when people are thinking because they usually think they're agents. That's such a great little tip. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, oftentimes too, new clients will come to me through existing clients. So it's pretty uncommon at this point because our agency has been around for 40 years and I've been agenting for maybe 13 or 14 years now. It's pretty uncommon that somebody would be pitching me that I don't at least know through a current client. So talk to your colleagues and say, hey, I have this idea. Who's your agent? Are they taking on new clients? Would you be willing to make an introduction? And then on the other side of that, I'm getting an email from my author saying, hey, so-and-so reached out to me. Here's what, you know, they, my clients know me best. They know how I like to work. So is this the right time to query you? Are you taking on new projects? And then they would make a personal introduction. And, and I think that's really, you know, the most likely avenue for us to be meeting new clients at this point, although not entirely the only possibility. Okay, perfect. And then something else I've been hearing kind of thrown around lately is which route to go. So do you traditionally Mm. publish a book? Do you self-publish? Can you go through each of those and maybe what the benefits are? Yeah. So, I mean, it's a really personal decision in terms of what your specific career goals are. Ultimately, both paths, traditional publishing and self-publishing, are going to result in a beautifully printed book that you can hold in your hands and that you can sell. Some key differences are how that book comes to the the shelf and, and how the book is sold. There are many differences between the two different paths, but I talk endlessly about the three primary considerations. The first being financial. In traditional publishing, a publisher is going to offer you an advance. And in self-publishing, you are your publisher. You are financing the publishing of your book. To what extent is far more nuanced. But ultimately, like, do you have the funds to back your book or do you want to be paid in advance? And people are probably listening and thinking, well, I definitely want to be paid to write my book, right? (laughs) I don't want to pay for this myself. However, that leads me to the second consideration, which is control. And I mean that in the best sense of the word. Do you want to control the look and feel of your book? Do you want to control who's doing the editing? Do you want to control how it's laid out and designed? And that's a really, like, especially for food bloggers, you have a really specific brand on your site. You have a really specific voice. You know, no matter what a publisher says, you want to take your own photos. And photos is like a whole other mm-hmm. can of worms that we can open if we want. But generally speaking, if, if you want to drive that bus, which is an analogy I use in the course, like if you want to be in that driver's seat of publishing your own book, you want to self-publish. If you want to be just in the passenger seat, like heavily directing which way to go, kind of like, you know, Jim Carrey and I, <laughs> but ultimately like someone else is is leading the charge, then traditional publishing is the way for you. And then the third consideration is distribution. In traditional publishing, the publisher is bringing distribution to the table. So they have relationships with sales teams across the board. Your book is going to be sold in bookstores and special store specialty accounts, which are non-traditional bookstore accounts. And in self-publishing, you are your bookseller. So it is your job to get your book listed on deeply discounted online retailers that are highly trafficked that rhyme with schmamajan <laughs> or, you know, going to your local bookstore and getting it carried there. But ultimately, 
you know, you might end up with a bunch of books in your garage. So three primary considerations, although there's many, many nuances across the board. I can see the control piece being a big one for food bloggers since we do typically like to have control over our content. Little side bar known fact about a very well-known food blogger who has gone on to traditionally publish a few books, and I will not name who it is. They're wildly successful. I represented them for a brief period of time in which they went through the process of realizing that they wanted to control the whole process and did not necessarily want to work with an agent who was facilitating levels of compromise they weren't looking for, aka me. And they paid back a six-figure, they, they, lo- they lost a six-figure contract because Whoa. they wanted to drive that bus. And it took them a couple more years to get back on and they worked with a different agent, but it was a uh, it was an interesting time in blog to book wow, publishing so the moral drama. Of that story is figure that out before digging yeah. in. <laughs> yes, 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 exactly. I have a question about self-publishing and printing because I know that can be a hang-up. How does that typically work? Like, how do you go about finding where to where to print your book, and then do you do it just like in batches, or how does that work? It depends on the on the project, and I, it also depends on the print run. Typically, when we, as an not acting as a literary agent, but we're acting more as like a consultant for somebody who wants to self-publish, but have sort of our expertise along the way with them, we will connect you with a couple different book packagers who have relationships with printers in, in place. So they are doing the vetting, they are doing the negotiation on the cost, but ultimately in self-publishing, you're in charge of securing a printer, but we work with packagers, which are the self-published version of traditional publishing who are bringing those relationships to the table. That being said, I will say that right now at the very beginning of June, 2020, if we were to timestamp this time in publishing, we're looking at a very, very, very expensive time in our industry. Supply chain and production costs are drastically affected by the past few years. And so I'm hearing from publishers and packagers who, you know, who are direct liaison with these printers that printing four color books is anywhere from five to seven times the cost oh. of what it was even a couple of years ago. So I I'm pitching projects right now and getting getting rejections because the publishers are saying, this is just too expensive to print. We 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 love the project, but like we can't take it on. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, five to seven yeah. times. That's very wow. I mean, literally the the profit now is a loss on yeah on print runs. It's right. it's tremendous. And I just want to point out, I think you said June 2020. So I just want to make sure that everyone oh. knows like June 2022. <laughs> what is time? This isn't Thank like you. <laughs> what is time? Just wanted but different to make that than correct. June 2020. Yes. Yes, right. Because I can see people listening being like, wait a second. Why what? was it expensive then? No. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. No, that is all awesome information. And I can I can see where people would really want to self-publish now, but be turned away because of that cost. Mm-hmm. So how do you go around that? Do you just put it on hold and wait? Or yeah, are there any solutions? Again, I think it depends. I mean, for some projects, I think you can wait a little while and hope that things will level out. That being said, books take two years to come together in traditional publishing. So hopefully by the time the book is being printed, which is about, I don't know, 18 months from now, things will have leveled out a little bit. I don't think they're ever going to go back to where they were. That's not the indication that I'm getting from traditional publishers. But rather than wait, I think you can also educate yourself. I think the most clear way to stand out as an author wanting to publish a book is to show that you've done your research and your homework at every step in your pitching process. So when you query an an agent, when you send your proposal, every step you have an opportunity to show how educated you are on the industry. And so in your proposal, in your query letter, you can say, hey, I recognize that this is an expensive book to produce and here are the creative ways that I'd like to come to the table to make this happen. And maybe it's, I've partnered with a photographer who's a colleague and friend and they're really invested emotionally in doing this book and they're willing to reduce their rates at this time so I can bring this book to fruition. Or instead of 150 recipes, which was my original vision for this cookbook, I feel strongly that this book should come out within the next two to three years. And so I'm willing to reduce the recipe count down to 90 to 110 recipes at, you know, as part of the collaborational 
conversation with a publisher so that we can keep the page count below X number of pages, right? So call it out, show that you know what you're talking about and that it's not just like, I have this amazing idea and it has to be published and I have no understanding of like how that comes to be, right? You have an opportunity to show how educated you are. Has the cost of books gone up dramatically recently? So it's, that's a great question. Actually, yeah. We have books that when they are going back for a second printing or the publishers watching their inventory, they're going back and we're seeing that they're the, now being priced a little higher than the original list price. I mean, the list price that's printed on a book might even be changing right now based on the printing costs. But as you know, on large online retailers that rhyme with Amazon, prices are constantly fluctuating. But yes, generally speaking, if, if a book is going back for a reprint right now, the, there could be a fluctuation in the list price. Okay. And then I'm curious, because I know you have your finger on this pulse about what publishers are looking for all the time. Do you have any ideas to share with us about what publishers are currently looking for as far as cookbooks go? Yeah. So publishers are looking for really sound, approachable, well-tested recipes always, right? They're looking for a lot of personality and voice in books, a lot of storytelling. They are looking for more regional and deep cultural dives into different cuisines from around the world. And this really sort of picked up in the past couple of years, particularly with the Black Lives Matter movement. Publishers started really prioritizing diversity on their lists, on their author lists. Although the discrepancy between other aspects in the publishing industry and opportunity to acquire those books, so specifically BIPOC acquisition editors or people in the publicity and marketing departments understanding the nuances of how to market and promote books from cultures that are maybe not their identifying culture is still a really vibrant conversation in the industry. So there's there's this big space of what I like to think of opportunity between what publishers are asking for and the infrastructure of publishing to support that across the board. You know, that's one of the changes in the past few years. For us as an agency, we have always represented a really diverse author list, both in cuisines, skin color, topics, techniques. And so we've seen this ebb and flow in publishing happen in a more sort of expedited way in the past few years, although it's it's a space that we've been representing for a long time. Do you have recommendations for people who have ideas, like how to make them better to appeal to publishers right now? Yeah, I mean, I think start with a book proposal and a book proposal itself can feel really daunting. So specifically start with market research in the comp section and start with a handful of recipes, right? So one of the pieces of homework I give often is you think you have this great book idea. Okay, awesome. Do you have enough content to fill a book? Why is the book the form, the medium that that idea should be brought to life in? I'm not saying it shouldn't, but really because because books are so expensive to produce in time and money in effort and emotion, does your idea warrant a book versus something else, a podcast, a blog, pitch uh, recipe yeah. to a publication? So start writing a recipe list. Do you have 50 recipes or do you have 350 recipes, right? That's going to guide you one way or the other. And then also take a look at the competition and see, you know, is there a conversation already happening in this space? Yes. Cool. Okay. Do I have something unique to add to it? What is my unique voice and point of differentiation? Great. Now we're on track to, to yes, this should be a book. Hmm. That was, I love that you said that. Just like maybe it's another avenue that you need to explore. Mm -hmm. So just writing stuff out first is going to help you put, wrap your brain around it. And book proposals take a considerable amount of time and <laughs> yes. energy, right? So yes. you want to make sure that this is really something that is aligning with you and your business before you dig into that. Hello, food bloggers. Just a brief break in the episode here to chat about Rank IQ. It is my favorite keyword research tool for many reasons, but right now I just want to talk about the functionality of the tool and how easy it is to use compared to other keyword research tools. Have you ever opened a keyword research tool and had the urge to scream or pull your hair out in frustration because you have no idea what the heck is going on? You don't even know what you're looking at. 
yeah, I've been there. It's an extremely frustrating situation. The first time I opened Rank IQ, it was like the angels began humming and the golden gates slowly opened before me. Seriously, it was a super welcome surprise for me because Rank IQ is ridiculously easy to understand. It's so easy to use and it does not provide a bunch of numbers or details that you don't need to even know about. It is very uncluttered and straightforward. There are literally three columns of data after each keyword and all are super easy to understand. You know exactly what you're looking at. And those three columns are competition, visits per year, and time to rank. No crazy abbreviations or unnecessary data, just straightforward and helpful information that will help guide you through the process of finding those fruitful keywords. If you are overwhelmed by your keyword research tool and need a little bit of a change, check out Rank IQ to clear out a little bit of clutter. Go to rankiq.com to sign up and check it out for yourself. I hope you love it as much as I do. Now let's get back to the episode. And a book proposal is a business plan for your book idea. So it's really going to benefit you whether you pitch it today, tomorrow, a year from now. And we have guidelines on our website that walk you through each section of a book proposal. And that book proposal guideline question and guideline will be totally sufficient for any agency that you would, for any agent that you would pitch, because it's a, it's a really comprehensive list of questions for you. (laughs) Yeah. So I know we're going to, I'm going to ask you about your course in a little bit and what is involved there, but what are some other ways that people can self-educate before getting into say pitching or book proposals? I am just loving all of the resources available out there right now. I have to say, launching this course has really immersed me in the market for this, right? In the competition. And I see competition as collaboration. So I love Diane Jacob. I love her book, We'll Write for Food. Read it, right? I love her newsletter. I'm a paid subscriber to her newsletter. I don't think I pay for any other newsletters, to be honest. Like I just love her roundup. I love her assessment of industry trends. I love your podcast. I love the Everything Cookbooks podcast that just launched a couple months ago. It is essentially like a slightly different audio free version of my course. Like there's a lot of similar content presented in different ways because it's hosted by four authors, which is a different experience than my course, which is created by an agent working across the board with a bunch of different publishers. But we cover the same type of material. Listen, read, subscribe, take, take these, you know, take this information and then ask yourself, what am I hearing that is the same what am I hearing that's different? And why are these you know, messages or information about how this industry works different? A non-culinary specific resource is Jane Friedman. She's a writer and consultant and also produces a fantastic newsletter. Her information is just so timely. And then industry information. So IACP, International Association of Culinary Professionals, also Women's Media Group for any any listeners that identify as female is a fantastic organization. So just, and and it's across all media, so it's not just publishing, but really, you know, immerse yourself, learn, and then sort of take that step back and go back to, okay, what is my idea at hand and how can I best present it and pitch it? And this is all fresh in your mind because you just created your course, right? So this is like, I love that you're presenting all of this fresh material because you've just literally just dug dug into it yourself. So go consume all of it and then wrap your head around it a little bit more. Yeah, I really tried to take a look at what was out there because it's so important to support other people providing this type of content and information. And again, as an agent, we're uniquely positioned in this perspective across working with all the different publishers. And I'm working with many different authors at one time, pitching different projects. And so my perspective on how publishing works and what publishers are asking for of me and of my authors is is a is a unique perspective. And it complements the author perspective that's out there. It complements the writer's perspective and some self-published content that's out there too. Jason Logston is, you know, I know a colleague and dear friend for both of us. His self-publishing made easy course is something that I recommend all the time if you're trying to determine like, which path do I go down? Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate that you can see other people who contribute 
maybe same information, but from a different perspective and that you don't see it as like my course is the one and only, you know, like not, yeah, is, not at all. I love it. I yeah. listened to <laughs> Diane and I were talking at IACP and, you know, she was saying this advice she was giving out to, to her group. And I said, well, I don't agree with that at all. I can't believe you're saying that. She's like, really? Why do you think this? And we had this lively discussion. I'm like, this is exactly why people need to, yeah. you know, be be listening to it all, right? Reading it all. Agreed. And then forming your own opinion. Yeah. I mean, even having food blogging podcasts, there are multiple food blogging mm-hmm. podcasts, but we all have different experiences and stories and perspectives. So I encourage food bloggers, like eBlog Talk is not the one and only place that you should be going. Mm-hmm. Go listen to everything because you're going to get something different from all of us. So I, I really appreciate that you look outside of yourself and realize that there are other perspectives. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about socials, social yeah. media and numbers and how dun, dun, they dun. might spill over into cookbooks. What are your thoughts mm-hmm. on all of that? So I am flooded with, is it true that I need to have hundreds of thousands of followers to get a cookbook deal? And the answer is no, it's not true. In fact, most of my clients who have cookbook deals do not have hundreds of thousands of followers. Some do. Those are slightly easier doors to open, slightly easier conversations to open with editors. But the size of your social media following does not equal the end all be all of whether or not you're going to get a book deal. Again, what I think is most important is to recognize how to talk about platform and community and engagement within your book proposal to show hey, I'm a really educated author. I know how this works and I know how to reach my intended audience. And if you can't, if you're just making up ideas on how you would reach your intended audience, you're not ready to publish a book. But if you have a small and engaged community and you know how to reach them and you can explain how you've reached them in the past, that's what I want to see in a book proposal. I'd actually rather see proof of concept in reaching your community over hundreds of thousands of followers. So for example, maybe you have published a ebook or maybe you yourself have a course on, you know, how how to go vegan in 10 days and you have sold that successfully to x number of people and you have earned x amount in revenue. Show me that in the proposal as part of proof of concept that I X person knows how to reach my intended audience and market to them successfully. And that way, when you say I have 10,000 followers, you're showing me that you know how to engage them. And I joined this industry. I was on a very different path prior to doing agenting. I joined this industry right as that first wave of blog to book craze was happening. And so I watched big bloggers with huge followers get grouped up for these big six-figure advances. And then two years later, when those books came out, we didn't yet know how to market and sell to them. Some of those books sold really well to their audience, but the majority of them reach about maybe one to 3% Mm -hmm. conversion to sales. And so there are other people out there buying your book and there are other ways to follow and engage with your platform that are really important to, to address. That being said, I'll give you a little tip in this interview that I've been suggesting to some of my authors with moderate size social media followings. Put some endorsements in your proposal, right? If if you're saying, here are the people I know and love and here's the way they're going to support my book, reach out to two or three of them and say, hey, I'm in the process of putting my proposal together, sending it to an agent that I really want to work with and I'd love to make it shine as much as possible. Would you consider endorsing my work now to include as part of this process? If they're your true connections and and colleagues, they know how this industry works, they're going to be excited to help support you. And I think that's a way to make your proposal stand out among all the others that are getting pitched right now. Such great tips packed in there. I love all of that. Do you recommend having at least some sort of following in order to start a cookbook? What if somebody's just starting out literally brand new to food blogging? Is a cookbook for them or not? I don't think it's the right time. I think you will learn so much about your own food writing that is important if you're just starting out that it's premature for a book. 
pitch publications, get your name out there, start positioning yourself as an expert in that conversation and in that space. And yes, get some following behind you. You know, 700 followers is going to be a really big uphill battle. Is it possible? Sure. Is it a lot harder? Yes. Mm-hmm. I would say, you know, our sort of micro influencer size platforms when it comes to social media following is like 10,000 followers and up. Okay, perfect. Actually, in the course, I define different oh. platform sizes numerically, which was just something I was like, I got to just do this. So people stop asking me like, <laughs> what is a micro and what's a mega? Right. I, just, I just laid it all out for people. Oh, that's great because you do hear those terms and you're like, well, <laughs> what am I? Where am I? And where do I what? fall? It doesn't really matter. What matters is how you how you position your platform. But it is it is important to understand that positioning. And that's that's really what I want to see in a proposal. Okay. And then the ultimate question, Sally, where's the money? Yes. Can I make money in Ugh. book publishing? Oh, <laughs> I'd like to say yes, right? I All mean, the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I would say don't calculate your time down to an hourly rate if you're going to write a cookbook because no, you will not end up making mm. money. Even the biggest advances. Can you make money in cookbook publishing? It's possible, right? I mean, we have books that came out seven years ago and earn five figure royalties steadily every six months. That's great, right? They're earning money. They've earned out their advance. What was the production cost leading into that book project and the the photography? You know, those are all considerations to to make. There you can make a little bit of money in cookbook publishing. And really though, I like to think of a book as a big beautiful business card. It is going to open new doors for you in the media. It potentially can help you make money in other avenues of your business, things like speaking engagements, brand partnerships, appearances, recipe development. That's how cookbooks can help make you money. And the beautiful knowledge panel that you get on Google. I learned that recently. I was like, oh, what's a knowledge panel? And I looked... Googled my name and I was like, there is a knowledge panel for me because I've published a cookbook. It was really cool to find that out. Cool. Yeah. So, and it, does that happen all the time? Do authors automatically get knowledge panels? That was my understanding, but maybe you have more insights. I don't know. I'll oh. have to get back to you. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to do some digging. So I know that every like food bloggers listening are like really interested in getting the EAT from Google and just right. establishing all of that. And one of the SEO experts in our area was saying recently that a knowledge panel is a really good way to bump up your expertise, authority, and trust and all of that. Yes. And so then there were some conversations going on where people were like, well, maybe I should publish a cookbook just to get the the panel. So that is a shining feature. (laughs) That's so interesting. I don't know how like the integration works around that. And if there are certain requirements around like what type of book or how a book is like presented and coded. But I will say that one of the reasons to write a cookbook is to, you know, offer credibility as an expert in a certain area. And so, you know, what is the 10 years ago version of a knowledge panel? It's like, your byline, right? right? It's it's offering that credibility. But I don't know. I'm going to get back to you and look into that more. Yeah, I'm curious about it because I've asked around a little bit and nobody seems to really know. And I was also wondering if you write an ebook and you know go through the process of getting it on Amazon and all of that. Does that acquire help you acquire a knowledge panel too? Like there are kind of some question marks about that. But um, I think we need to get a Schmamazon. <laughs> a loodle and agent and author (laughs) together to have this discussion. Oh, yes. I think this is a future discussion. This would be really valuable. Okay. So is there anything else I want to ask you about your course? But before we get onto that, is there anything you feel like we've missed about cookbook publishing? We've covered a lot of great ground. I would just continue to put my offer out into the ether, which is that if this type of conversation sparks your interest, I have been offering very limited, but on a select basis, 15 minute slots and conversations with me, because as I've been talking about publishing and talking about the nuances of the content in the course, 
one of the most important things to keep in mind is that while there's a general like statement and overview of how this industry works, it's really person specific too, right? It really comes down to your career goals and your goals, your strategy, your your technique in, in entering the publishing space. And so I've been offering 15 minute conversations with people can, who can say like, here's here's what I'm thinking and here's my idea or here's my strategy and my ultimate goal. Do you think you know, the traditional route is the is the right path for me to get there. Awesome. That's so generous. Okay. Tell us about your course. I want to hear oh, all the my details. Baby, my yes, labor let's of hear love. about your baby. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was saying earlier before we came on, it feels like, you know, I went through the author process. I spent quite a bit of time taking our four decades of industry knowledge and packaging it into this self-paced course that people can find on our website, ekisgroup.com, or it's hosted on Podia. If you don't do the homework, although I do recommend that you do, it's essentially two and a half hours of everything you need to know about publishing, what an agent does, where to find one. It walks you through three real book deals that I've negotiated and all of the financials behind them. I help people determine the two different, you know, the differentiations between self-publishing and traditional publishing. And then there's like a really intense proposal module where I go through the guidelines that are available for free on our website, but I give you an agent tip with every single part of the proposal. So it really arms you with like, here are ways to stand out. And then there's this module at the end that is just like my little love baby of all the things <laughs> that people probably don't need to know yet, but always ask about. So how to work with photographers and what goes into collaboration agreements. What's the difference between publicity and marketing? There's a f- super fun flow chart as to whether or not you should work with an agent, because even though I am an agent, I don't necessarily think the agent relationship is right for everyone. You know, so it's it's got a lot of got a lot of good stuff in there. There's different activities to do along the way. And um, you'll come out of the course with a recorded pitch for your idea and um, your overview started for your book proposal. And I make this joke in workshops that I do, but like I'm that person who makes a to-do list with the first two or three things on it that I've already done just so I can cross them off. I do that. Was, that's, yes, right? That's like funny. people. So I was like, <laughs> not going to release a course unless somebody came out of it with something started because you you really want to you really want to jump start working on your book whether or not you you turn your attention to it tomorrow or not it it gives you an opportunity to feel like you've accomplished something and and get started this sounds amazing i can see so many people wanting to dig into that i we will definitely link to that in the show notes but where else can people find this if they're interested <laughs> They can find it on our website at ekisgroup.com. And then you can follow me on social media, my name at Sally Eckes. And I post about the course. And then I also post other industry information. You'll also catch some, uh, you know, little photos of my daughter walking around on there. And then on Facebook, I run a community called How to Be a Cookbook Author. And that's for everyone listening who's interested in learning about the industry. There are previously published authors in there. There are designers, there's photographers, and I post industry news and things that I find really interesting and helpful about this publishing space that I have access to through other industry resources. And then there's also opportunities to ask questions and network and, again, collaborate with one another. Because at the end of the day, that's that's what this is all about, is supporting with one another so we can see your books sitting next to each other on the shelf really successfully and then you know flying off the shelf with massive sales because you're supporting each other's hard work and endeavors. Oh, all so well said. Thank you, Sally. This was super fun. I really appreciate you joining me again on the podcast. Thank you so much, Megan. It was such a pleasure. I really appreciate your time today. Yeah, you too. And do you have another favorite quote or words of inspiration to share with food bloggers? This isn't food blogging specific, but as as I've come to to realize putting this course together and you know the vulnerability of working so hard on something and and putting it out into the world, I hear that a lot from my authors and a quote that was on some sort of motivational card years ago, which I cannot attribute to its intended sayer because I I don't remember and I don't think it was even on there. It's just this little note card that said, it is safe to look within. And I would just add, so do so and get cooking. Ah, I love that. That's so perfect for food bloggers. That is inspiring. Thank you so much. Thanks, Megan. Yeah. So we will put together show notes for you, Sally. So if anyone wants to go look at those and get all the resources, she mentioned so many great resources here in this episode. So go to eblogtalk.com forward slash Sally Eckes 2. 
You've already told everyone where they can find you. So I don't think we need to recover that. So thank you, Sally, again for being here. And thank you for listening today, food bloggers. I will see you in the next episode. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Eat Blog Talk. If you enjoyed this episode, post it to your social media feed and stories. See you next time.